welcome to Cherry Hinton Baptist Church. Uh, the focus of our worship is that man Jesus. Um, so uh, we are going to uh, meet with him. And uh, <clears throat> we're in a series of 10 weeks looking at people meeting Jesus in Luke's gospel. Um, in a moment, we're going to be putting ourselves in the shoes of the soldier and the servant in Luke chapter 7. Uh, but first, I just want to dwell on Jesus's extraordinary character and teaching uh, that comes up in Luke chapter 6. Um, Jesus said, love your enemies. Now, in Jewish thought, and indeed in the 21st century, particularly if you look at newspapers, we do go for attention-grabbing, hyperbolic headlines. Um, I, I, I saw one last week to say that COVID has robbed us of our ability to do risk assessment. Um, now, the article later on said that the reactions to COVID have slightly diminished our ability to deal with risk. But the headline said, COVID robs us of our ability to do risk assessment, which wasn't actually true. So sometimes people look at Jesus's teaching here and, and think, oh, Jesus must have just been using hyperbole here. Um, and maybe what Jesus really meant is that if you're going to mete out punishment to God's enemies who jolly well deserve it, um, just don't take too much pleasure in rubbing their noses in it. Uh, I am afraid, if that's what you think, that I would venture to suggest that Jesus actually meant this. Um, I think that Jesus wants us to have a close relationship with everyone. That's why in John's Gospel it says, God so loved the world, not just the nice ones, but everyone. He wants to be in close relationship with everyone, and he wants us to do the same. Uh, which incidentally scares the living daylights out of me. Uh, so if that's scaring the living daylights out of you, you know, this is a good place to be because we're going to feed on the spirit of Jesus to enable us to do this. Um, uh, outside the church building at the moment is uh, this poster, which says that the things that you can see in the hands coming together of cooperation, of connectedness, of communication, of welcome, of integration. That's what he wants us to be doing with our enemies. That is utterly extraordinary in my book. Um, I'd like to look at a, a painting by Stanley Spencer that I think enables us to think about what Jesus had in mind. Uh, if you look at the character, and I believe that this is the Jesus character in the picture, he's, uh, if you look at his hands, he's got an animal in his hands. And I hope by it's obvious that if you look up the, um, the, up the back of it, there's uh, a nasty sting there. That is a scorpion. If you actually look on the ground next to his right foot, there's another scorpion. The only scorpion in the picture was the one on the ground. You might be forgiven for thinking that what Jesus thinks that you need to do to scorpions is to stamp on them. But it's the one in his hand that is extraordinary. It's got its sting up ready to inflict a sting on the person holding it. And if you look at Jesus's fingers, I think they're rather fat. I think that's because Jesus has been stung before. It's not just that he's naively saying, oh, it'll be okay for me to hold this scorpion 
and not be harmed. Although there are passages of scripture that use exactly that. I think that he has been stung. And maybe that line that says you will not be harmed by the scorpion is saying that your soul won't be harmed by the scorpion. Look at Jesus's face. Uh, I think his gaze is on the scorpion in his hand. This is God so loved to the world, including those who behave like scorpions. And there's a, there's a wistfulness of Jesus in his, in his face of, Maybe it's a bit of sorrow in his face. But I think that what you have there is uh, love for something that may be about to attack. And it's into his presence that we gather uh, this morning so that we might be born again into those people who love our enemies. Uh, I think that the implication of a love like this means that ending up on a cross was inevitable. While there were many meanings to the cross of Jesus, the one that I find most powerful is that the cross is um, a symbol of the whole of Jesus's life. Uh, the vulnerability with that scorpion is that he, he goes into situations where he's going to get hurt because all he does is to love the scorpions. And most of the time, the scorpions just carry on with what the scorpions do. And therefore, I come to the place of the cross, which is for me the whole of Jesus' life. And I, I think that I'm astonished by his mercy towards that scorpion and to all those that behave like scorpions. And that I know that that isn't in me. I feel broken in some. But I thank God for uh, his love. And um, <laughs> that's what I came across this um, uh, writing uh, last week that I've asked uh, Norman, who's in the uh, Family Centre, to uh, read for us. Um, the, uh, uh, later on, I'll be asking whether anybody uh, uh, feels that one or more of these things um, chimes with, with your experience. But for the moment, uh, let us listen and thank God uh, for all the ways in which he uh, is generous to, to us and helps us and is uh, so full of grace and generosity to us. Thank you very much, Norman. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives. When I am weak, he is strong. When I am lost, he is the way. When I am afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I am hurt, he heals me. When I am broken, he bends me. When I am blind, he leads me. When I am hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he is with me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. Amen. Uh, okay, so uh, time to get on with uh, the story for the day, which is from Luke chapter 7. Um, Esther's uh, going to be uh, reading for us. 
Um, just a reminder that in Luke chapter 6, Jesus has said, you must love your enemies. And I think that people will, will be thinking that question I posed earlier in the service is, is he for real? Let's watch this guy and see what this looks like or whether he doesn't mean it. OK, so um, uh, Esther, if you could uh, do the bit that's on the screen at the moment. Um, our Wi-Fi isn't really working, so I might cut out. Um, Thank you for the warning. If you do, I'll swipe somebody else. But but th at the moment, you seem to be fine. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. OK, so Jesus has been saying, love your enemies. I think it's significant that the people who were listening um, is there. I, I think there's an implication there that not everybody was listening. Uh, some people were just going along and, oh, there's a big crowd here. And they were um, they were just part of being a big group. And that's jolly. And they weren't really listening to what Jesus was saying. But Jesus speaks to people who are prepared to listen. And they're mixed up with people who weren't really listening in the first place. But Jesus speaks and continues to speak to those who are listening. And I hope that I'm listening. Um, uh, I think that the people though were listening, they were thinking, is this guy for real? And I think that the crowd is looking to see, they've heard that Jesus says, love your enemies. What, what, What's this going to look like? And let's see what happens. There, a centurion servant, whom he valued highly, was ill and about to die. OK, so we've got enemies. OK, and if you're living under occupation of a foreign country, it seems to me a centurion is the archetypal enemy. The person that is uh, uh, the instrument of fear and death in your society. That if anybody uh, stands up to the rule of Rome, then they are intimidated and humiliated and strung up on a cross and crucified. They are also the people who enslave you. So not only is he a centurion, he's got a servant, which is, again, slavery is a, uh, an immense evil on earth. The owning by one person of another. Um, it's, uh, we should, um, uh, there are people involved in modern day slavery now. And in one sense, they are our enemies. They are the enemies of good society. So does Jesus really mean that we should love our enemy? The staggering thing that I came across in this passage was that the first evidence of grace in this passage isn't shown by Jesus. If you look, the first bit of extraordinary grace comes from the centurion. For slavery to work, you, one of the tools I believe that you uh, in your arsenal of keeping people enslaved is to make them believe that they are worthless. That um, people will behave like slaves and worthless people if they believe themselves to be worthless. And therefore it's incumbent on slave owners to make sure that the slaves are of no consequence to them. That if a slave is going to die, that's fine. You're of no value, you are worthless. I can just go down to the slave market and get another one because slaves have no value. If 
slaves begin to believe that they have value, then the days of slavery are numbered because they just don't believe that they are slaves. So the centurion, I believe, is doing extraordinary courageous um, act of mercy towards somebody who the system says that he should treat as being worthless. And he doesn't just value him, he values him highly. I believe that if we are going to love our enemies, I believe that it begins with valuing people. I think that that's what Jesus does here, that he values the centurion later on in the story. But it's because he can see that the centurion is already valuing other people. I think that sometimes when I'm refusing to love my enemies, uh, what I want to do is for the enemy to change in such a way or the slave to change in such a way that um, I, they, they're not my enemy, that they, we start being nice to them and then I start valuing them. I think that the first step in this process of um, loving your enemies comes when the centurion decided he was going to value his slave, the slave that he, um, uh, the, 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 the rules said that he shouldn't be valuing. And, and I think that if we're having a struggle with loving our enemies, loving the people that, that hurt us and hate us, the first step is to find something in them that we value. And that's a hugely courageous step because the end is, as soon as you start doing that, 50% of the job is done. If I just treat somebody as the headline figure of uh, whatever it is that they do badly that hurts me, if that's all I ever think of when I think of this person, I won't value them because what I'm focusing on is the thing that's bad about them. So if I just see the centurion and I just see him as a centurion, a instrument of wrath and terror of the occupying power, I can't value that because it's wrong. They shouldn't be doing it. If I just see him as a slave owner, and that's all I see of this person. I, I'm not valuing him because I shouldn't be valuing somebody. Um, the, the act of owning a slave, I, that is not valuable. I think what Jesus does to this person is that he sees behind it and sees the fact that he's valuing his slave. And Jesus warms to that and says, good on you, mate. Now, that's subversive. That's my kind of guy. And that he's warming to that. And I believe that this story that starts off with this is that if you've got a problem with loving somebody, look for the thing that you can cherish in them. Uh, and I believe that we're all made in the image of God. And that uh, Jesus will open our eyes to seeing what is good so that we might uh, value them. Anyway, let's see how the story progresses. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Thank you. So the centurion hears of this person who says, love your enemies. It's interesting that he doesn't go directly to Jesus. There's some indications later on in the story as to why that might be. But what he does is instead of going to Jesus, he sends somebody else. It's possible that this is just an abuse of power, is that he can't be bothered to go and see Jesus himself. Possible that therefore he just 
get somebody else to do it because uh, he can't be bothered. Also, maybe he sends people to Jesus because he's not going to give Jesus the accolade of being worthy of the centurion's time himself. It's, it's possible. And, and when re dealing with real life situations, just going back to the highly valued thing in verse two, it's possible that this centurion was a really, really nasty piece of work. And he just knew when he was onto a good thing that this slave worked twice as hard as anybody else. And if he died, he'd have to go to the slave market and, and, and spend money on a replacement. And that was a bad investment. And it could be that he was purely motivated by avarice. Um, it's possible, and it's possible that this centurion was trying to snub Jesus. And I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that in a story like this, because that's the way it is for the people that we're finding it difficult to love. Because there are always reasons not to love them. Because even their good points, we rather suspect, aren't good points in the first place. And what this story uh, encourages me to do is to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's to treat people as though they were really good eggs. I think that that's what Jesus is doing here. That Jesus doesn't tell the centurion off for just sending some other people to come and see him. Jesus doesn't go and say, oh, you should have come to me yourself. You're doing a put down. Jesus, I think, looks at people in the best possible light. I think that's extraordinary. Um, let's see what happens next. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man is first to have to do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Okay, now this is open to different interpretations. It's possible that the building of the synagogue was a calculated manipulative idea that the centurion had in order to have an easy life for himself and to keep the rabble quiet. And it was a calculated thing to, in order to oppress these people, you just need to give them a little bit of something that's good so that you can then completely economically dominate them and keep them in as have as many slaves as possible. So it's possible that this is really cynical on the centurion's part. And it's possible that this ostensible, oh, I really love the nation of Israel, was, was a complete con, that, that he didn't mean it at all. And, and that's true for some people that we meet, that even their good points, they're not that good. Again, Jesus doesn't question this. I, I think the seeing people in the best possible light as a way of bringing peace is such an important thing to do and one that I find so difficult to do in practice. Um, my feeling is that the non-cynical interpretation of this is that the centurion was a good guy in this respect, that not only does he value servants, he also builds synagogues and he loves the nation. He, he says, what's good for these people and then does that? Um, and as a result, these people pleaded on his behalf. Um, so it could be that righteousness has its payback. Unfortunately, in, in verse four and five, it's also possible that this guy's a real thug and a bully. And these people are terrified of them and therefore say something that they don't believe to Jesus, saying, oh, he really loves our neighbor. He really loves the synagogue because they're desperate to make sure that Jesus comes. They've been told to ask Jesus to come to the house. They rather fear that it's crucifixion for them if they don't deliver Jesus back to the centurion. So it's possible that these people are motivated by fear.
I rather suspect, though, that there's a whole load of grace going on in the centurion's life and in these people's life that makes its fertile ground for Jesus. And I would encourage us to be people that constantly think the best of other people and act accordingly. So we're the people that plead earnestly on other people's behalves and, and say what is good about them. Not because we're afraid of them, but because we genuinely believe it. Um, this sounds like, by the way, intercessory, intercessory prayer. This sounds like uh, people that are praying for the centurion and his servant. That's, that's what happens in church when we, or and in our daily lives, when we pray for other people, that we're saying to God, come on, we want your grace to be manifest in uh, this person's life. Uh, what happens next? Uh, go Esther, verse six. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him. Okay, I've just paused it there because it's probably only in English that this happens. So Jesus went along with them. Sometimes I feel that the way God works is he's asking us to take the first step of grace. In Luke uh, chapter six, previous chapter, it says give. And it will be given unto you full measures, shaken together, pressed down into your lap. But Jesus goes along with us. He, he says, you do the first thing of give, and then I'm going to go along with that. And it shall be given to you full measure, shaken together, pressed down into your lap. OK, uh, so Jesus went along with them. I rather like that, that when we pray outrageous prayers, uh, Jesus says, yeah. I'll go along with that. Those people at Cherry into Baptist Church, I'll go along with that. People in that household, I'll go along with that. That's the sort of generosity that that's, that's my people. Um, those are my children and I'm really proud of them and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Incidentally, just in terms of being learning from your kids and, and following their example, I, I, I went on to St Andrew Street Baptist Church um, service yesterday. They were inducting a new minister and it was my son who was dealing with Zoom and I learned things from him. You may have noticed that I've worked out how to unmute people because um, uh, as you come into church now it asks you will you give permission for the host to unmute you which means that um i can just do it without asking you to do it uh and, and it makes the service flow anyway it's really good and i learned something else uh, from jack yesterday it's marvelous to learn stuff from your kids um and i think that god's like that that his kids do something generous and god says yeah i'll go along with that um, anyway, I, I think that's, anyway, so what does Jesus actually say? Um, uh, do carry on uh, talking, which I will unmute you. Go. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I am not suitable to have you come under my roof. That is why I consider myself worthy to come to you. Okay, and this is the... Uh, this is the evidence that I've been alluding to, to say that there's evidence later on in the passage as to what the centurion's really like. I think he knows what real love he wants. He knows what real life is about. And he knows that however much he loves and values his slave, that he's deeply uncomfortable with what he's asked to do in his job that as a centurion he has to crucify people and, and he knows that that's an instru instrument of terror and oppression and he's uncomfortable with that and maybe he also knows that he's deeply uncomfortable with slavery and uh, he knows that he can't abolish it all on his own and but and he knows the limitations of the good things that he is doing he knows that he's not suitable uh, to have Jesus under his roof, because he sees something in Jesus that is the full Monty. 
it's 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 really loving your enemies it's putting that scorpion on you and being comfortable um uh, he knows that he he's he doesn't consider himself to be worthy to come to you um, i think that this is a mark of somebody who is uh in a good relationship with god or has the potential for a good relationship with god where we we see who we are and we we know that what's in our heart and what's in the heart of God are two completely different things. Uh, we get wind of the fact that Jesus wants us to love our enemies, and and we know that there's something in us that really doesn't want to do that, and that we're uncomfortable Jesus getting too close because because we're just not like him deep deep down. Um, it is a, a privilege to be the pastor of this church community. And um, it means that there are some conversations that I have with people that aren't generally widespread. And the conversations that I find most inspiring are when I get wind of the fact that somebody's in this place, that there's a genuine uncomfortableness with themselves that arises because they have glimpsed what Jesus is like. And uh, I, I've, I've had those conversations and, and I believe that God is particularly present when you feel like that. I believe it is the gateway to growth and to, uh, to, to, to shining with the radiance of God. Uh, I believe that Moses' face, face shone, but he was not aware of it. I think that Moses was in the, I do not consider myself worthy to go up to Mount Sinai to see the Lord. Uh, it was others that saw the, the, the shining face. Um, I don't think that he did. Um, and I, so if you're feeling an, an inadequate Christian, uh, I would venture to suggest that that's a really good, good thought to have, uh, that it will enable you to turn to God and to find more of the riches of his grace than those of us that don't actually feel this. So good for you, Centurion. Uh, what happens uh, next? This is going from, but say the word. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Uh, thank you. So that the centurion, having asked Jesus to come, knows that his highly valued, and I believe loved servant, is ill. He, his understanding of the way things are for Jesus is that if you say the word, my servant will be healed. I think that's a really good template for our prayers for this coming week. That we leave situations in the hand of God and say, we pray that your word may be spoken. And we believe that what you will, will take place. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And we believe that when God says something, it will be done. Because we have experience of that ourselves. Uh, well, some of us do. This is a man under authority as a centurion. Who can say, go and come and do this? Uh, 
And that's the way it is for God. Is that let's uh, be people that pray, knowing that when the Lord says something, that it will happen and that we trust him for that. Uh, and it uh, finishes off uh, last two lines, uh, Esther, and uh, marvellous that your internet connection has held out until now. And the men who had been sent returned to the house, found the servant well. Because uh, it's interesting that it isn't recorded when Jesus says, your servant is healed. If you look back in verse seven, the centurion says, if you say the word, my servant will be healed. All Jesus says is, wow, that's amazing faith. And the man then goes and finds out that his servant has been well. I wonder whether that's a case of Jesus has just gone along with the centurion, as, as Jesus did in verse 6. Jesus just went with them. As this centurion has said, if you say the word, my servant will be healed. Jesus says, fine, you said it. Um, now, I'd rather suspect that Jesus did say something in between verses 9 and 10, but it's interesting that Luke doesn't record it. Luke doesn't record Jesus saying, saying the word. It's almost as though from the previous chapter, give and it will be given unto you full measure, uh, shaken together, pressed down uh, into your lap. Uh, maybe that's an example of that. I find that um, uh, extraordinary. Thank you very much uh, for uh, reading that, uh, Esther. Um, so I think there are four things that uh, we can go away with. Uh, one, uh, Jesus said, love your enemies, and then did it. Um, I pray that what comes out of my mouth and what comes in my actions and what I am as a person are in harmony this week. Uh, the centurion valued his servant. I think that Jesus valued the centurion. I think the crowd valued the centurion. There was a whole load of subversive valuing going on. Let's be subversive in the way in which we value other people. Let's see beyond the negatives, the things that we quite rightly want to distance ourselves from. But it's not the person that we're distancing ourselves from. It's from particular actions. Let's look beyond the negatives. Uh, let's dare to look so much at God that we feel deeply uncomfortable with ourselves. Uh, the two go together and let's trust God to say the word and for things to happen. Uh, so may you and may I know the blessing of integrity. May you and I know the blessing of valuing others. May you and I know the blessing of turning to God. And may you and I know the blessing of trusting God to say the word and for healing and peace to take place today and every day forever. Amen. Amen.